Good afternoon. I'm Stefan Yost, the Michael and Sonia Kerner Director and CEO of the Art Gallery of Ontario here in Toronto. I'm joined by Anne Pasternak, who's the Shelby White and Leon Levy Director of the Brooklyn Museum in New York City. Before we begin this conversation, um, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the traditional territory of the Mississauga of the New Credit, which has also been the home to the Huron-Wendat and Haudenosaunee people through time. I'm glad that you've taken a time out of your day. We've got, I don't know, 500,000 people listening and joining in. Um, so just thank you for, for, for your time. We receive support from TD's Ready Commitment. They've been fantastically supportive about helping us move uh, conversations online, uh, not just for the AGO, but throughout Toronto. So thank you to Toronto Dominion. Um, upcoming speakers include Belinda Tate from the Kalamazoo Institute of Art and Maria Balchal from the Tate in London. So we're starting to go international. Today's format, as always, is really simple. Anne and I will have a little chat and you can keep your questions coming in. I'll ask your questions and it'll last, I don't know, 35 minutes or so. So um, first of all, welcome, welcome, welcome Anne. It's a joy to be with you, Stefan. Thank you. And I hope everything is well at the AGO. We're doing all right. You know, as I like to say, we have a lot of challenges, but we're not in crisis. So right. that's kind of my worldview right now. Um, obviously, there's been huge amount of kind of changes in the last nine, 12 weeks, COVID, kind of the murder of, of, of black folks by police. It's been really kind of amazing, difficult, interesting, dynamic time. Who's an artist that you're looking to now um, that kind of gives you insight during the period we're looking at? You know, there's a lot of art and artists to be thinking about during this time period. You know, we can look historically at our collections and look at the roots of um, uh, historic racism in the United States uh, through the collections. But I will say that I'm hardly on social media anymore. It's too brutal. But I was on social media. I was on Instagram recently. And my friend, a wonderful artist who lives in Brooklyn, works in Brooklyn, Hank Willis Thomas, Hi. had a wonderful post. And Hank had um, uh, a post of protesters by the Brooklyn Bridge uh, next to one of his sculptures, which is of a black man's, you know, arm raised. And it was kind of this incredible moment of, you know, of, in a way, um, his dreams being materialized. And it was just yet another reminder about how art can chronicle our times, how it can uplift us, how it can tell truths, how it can expose lies. Um, and, and really being a rallying cry. And so uh, I would say this week, the most inspiring artwork uh, that I've had guiding my way has been Hank's piece. I always think of uh, Hank as the son of Deb Willis. She's um, one of the fantastic seminal art historians and did a really important uh, exhibition that uh, I worked at a museum that co-hosted it after, um, after I went on tour called Reflections in Black. So uh, Deb Willis, I haven't He's an amazing artist. And Mom is a, a, a truly great, and important scholar. So, and, and artist in her own right, she's a photographer as well. Oh, I didn't know a that. really, really exceptional artist. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's Deb a, Willis. Incredible family. Yep. All right. That's it's it's, Deb. It's all right. Good. Good. Uh, he was here about a year ago for uh, the Amia Prize. So he was, uh, which the public selects who the winner is, and so. Oh, that's great! I love that. Uh, yeah, so that was a, a good. Um, tell me, uh, tell me a little bit about because this is a conversation. Um, social change conversations are very, very familiar to the Brooklyn Museum. Right? Why does everybody always want to talk to me about social change? Yeah, because <laughs> because your museum's been engaged in it in a, a pretty pretty serious way. Um, is it something about the DNA of Brooklyn in the museum, or is this more recent? Well, I always say that actually the social good has always been in the DNA of the Brooklyn Museum. Um, you know, we were founded not to um, show off the great wealth and taste of our founders, uh, but instead um, Brooklyn was a newly forming independent city. And uh, the idea ba ba based on immigrants and the idea was to help educate all these new immigrants from around the world in you know, what we call today Brooklyn. Um, and if we were to expose them to each other's histories and cultures, they'd be better citizens and it would contribute to that ideal of the American project. 
Um, so that kind of social good has been in our DNA as an institution. Of course, there are other issues of institutions like ours, which we don't have to get into at this, this moment. Uh, but yes, it, it is part of our DNA and it is part of the DNA of Brooklyn itself, I think. Yeah, I, the other year, um, the board of the AGO went to New York to talk to different museum directors. You were kind enough to, to have a conversation with our board. And what was interesting is we went to MoMA and the Met and these amazing museums, but in many ways, we felt more aligned from a mission perspective with the Brooklyn Museum. And that, that, that I think surprised us. That kind of well, I'm really glad to hear it. We're, we know there's a lot of work to be done. We're on it. We're getting there. We're making a lot of progress. And it gives us great joy when our, our beloved and respected colleagues um, see it and appreciate it. So thank you. When you look forward, say, in 10 years, um, what's your wildest dream for the Brooklyn Museum? Uh, well, the first wild dream is not, uh, is not sexy. But okay. from director to director, it'll yeah. be uh, building solid financial foundations. Mm. The, yeah. The, yeah. the truth of the matter is um, that uh, only 5% of the philanthropy in New York City goes to Brooklyn. Huh. And uh, it's a shocking number when you realize that if Brooklyn were an independent city, it would be the third largest city in the United States. Interesting. So, so the philanthropic dollars get kind of sucked to the, the center. Yeah, they get stuck to the center. And so, and so uh, we've, we've always struggled with extremely inadequate uh, financial foundations. Yeah. And I want to do something about that. I also want to do something about really updating our building. It's a glorious, yes, it is. you know, landmark Beaux-Arts uh, building. But in fact, it's very old and it needs a lot of modernization. So those are not the sexy things, yeah. but they're important things. And yeah. then I would say in terms of the stuff that's really fun, it's about trailblazing new ways of being a museum, how we activate our collections, what we collect, what stories we tell, um, the kinds of canon expanding exhibitions we do, and how we serve community. Yeah. Um, and I have been really inspired by other kinds of business models mm -hmm. as I think about the future of the Brooklyn Museum. So I'm sure this is true where you are, uh, but libraries, for example, had uh, have done a lot to really reimagine. They're way ahead of the museum They're sector. They're way ahead. Way ahead, yes. And I think it's so amazing. And so for, for me, you know, I'm very inspired about ways that we can think about how a museum can not only just, you know, collect and, and study and preserve our collections, but how we can really contribute to um, meaningful social change in the world. Yeah. And, you know, you and I know, Stefan, that culture leads to the social change that leads to the political and policy change we must have in our yeah. world. So, yeah. so uh, for me, um, having a more progressive business model for the museum um, will be a great contribution if I can get there. Well, we are getting there, but yeah. we, we, we're just begun. I mean, there's this interesting thing where on one hand, every museum director thinks, God, it'd be great to have a billion dollar endowment, right? Who, which nonprofit leader doesn't think that? On the other hand, a billion dollar endowment can also prevent change, prevent evolution, right? So how do you have the capital needed to run it sufficiently and then also not have it just be fundamentally a conservative thing, which doesn't allow change? Right. Well, that's where mission and values come into part, right? Yeah. That if your mission mandates a kind of relevance, relevancy and your values are in alignment, well, then, you know, you're going to help protect the institution from stagnation. So leading, um, I think we've all become even more aware of our imperfect leadership in the last you know, four months. I think, I think every museum director, I think I was like, whoa. Oh, I didn't know if you were talking about me or Donald Trump, but I think we're talking about me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Who's that? I, I haven't seen him in the news lately. Yeah, sorry. If from Canada, we, we avoid it or try to. Um, uh, so, uh, <laughs> I wish I could. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I've got to say all three levels of government here have been working really well together. It's been um, super eye-opening and really impressed at, at the, the city, the provincial, and the federal government. Um, I don't know what's going on behind the scenes, but my interactions with them have been really, really positive. I got to say, Americans, as you all probably know, um, are always like, why can't we be more like Canada? 
<laughs> as, uh, as, as an American, I'm learning now about Canada and it's been, been great. It's been a really good four years. Um, what, so obviously, what are the skills that you're relying on more now than you were and where did you learn those skills? Oh, well, um, I, I guess the primary skill that I'm not very good at, but I'm trying really hard is listening. It's really, really important if I'm going to learn and this institution is really gonna transform that I listen to all sorts of stakeholders. So I'm trying with care and patience to listen and love you know, and empathy to listen to my staff, uh, to listen to our community stakeholders. And I have to say, uh, to listen to artists, the process has been extremely rewarding and inspiring. So it's not something I'm, I'm great at because as directors, we're used to being the mouthpieces yep. for our institutions and people ask us questions all the time. So we're used to talking all yep. the time. Um, so hitting that pause button has been really fantastic. Um, and, um, uh, what other skills am I really relying on right now? Well, it's a good thing I'm ADHD yeah. because I have to multitask like crazy right now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, I try I, to limit it I to learned. 15. I try to limit it to 15 Zoom calls a day. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you have to, right. So, so, and they're each an hour long. Yeah, yeah. good luck. Uh, so, um, so that's not something, of course, I've learned. It's just who I am. Yeah. Uh, but it is useful in a moment like this when there's so much coming at us yes. at all moments. Yeah, I yeah, know. Um, and you say you're listening, and, and it's great to admit that maybe that's not, you know, the, the, the skill that you've always um, cultivated. Um, what are you hearing? Um, you know, I'm, I'm learning a lot and, uh, you know, I, I, um, I was on a path probably, you know, late in my career, you know, probably around the time I turned 40, um, because I realized I could kind of talk the talk when it came to issues of ra racial equity, but I wasn't walking the walk. And so I have been on a mission of learning and self-reflection and action ever since that time. And, you know, I, it's like a lifetime of unlearning and being shaped by society and education uh, and, and reshaping oneself. Um, so I'm learning a lot um, about every nuance of how what we do impacts our communities of color and in particular our black and brown audiences. Um, and um, it's been very, uh, very stimulating and very hard because I wish I was even further along than I am. Yeah. You know? I, I, I know your, your mom and last time we, when we had a uh, coffee in Brooklyn, you were um, speaking or we in New York, in Manhattan, we were having coffee and you were speaking so affectionately about her and kind of um, what she does. What are you learning from her? Uh, honestly, yeah, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're 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 uh, not the answer I expected. <laughs> you, know, you know, my my um, my mother is just really focused right now yeah. on you know getting her nails done and her hair cut and when can the library open in the yeah. senior center. So I'm you know <laughs> yeah yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I guess I'm learning what it looks like to be able to live in the presence with uh, not a lot of uh, stress. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We, we have a question here. Could you please describe the diversity of the Brooklyn Museum and the public it serves? Um, yeah. and, and how do they match? How does your audience link to the city? Because I think that's a really great kind of foundational question. So yeah, it's a, it's a super great question. First of all, let's look at our, our board and our team. Um, so, you know, my predecessor, a wonderful man named Arnold Lehman, uh, was thinking about diversity um, at, at the institution long before it was enforced upon museum directors in New York and in the nation and long before it was uh, seen as a meaningful thing to do. And so I inherited a uh, fairly robust diverse staff at all levels of the institution. In truth, the leadership is primarily white, but we have leaders of people of color of all backgrounds um, throughout the hierarchy of the institution. Um, and we have a very active diversity, equity, inclusion, and access mouthful uh, task force that is, uh, has been working with me and our leadership team and our board on uh, strategic planning, 
uh, to really advance our efforts in everything that we do. And mostly interestingly, we've been working on our own internal practices um, and how we advance the pipeline. Um, and then we're situated uh, in central Brooklyn and we're surrounded by communities like Park Slope, which is primarily uh, tends to be more white and middle class and the upper middle class and communities like Crown Heights and Bed-Stuy and, you know, and others uh, much more diverse black and brown uh, communities and uh, working people. And um, our audience actually identifies um, about more than 50% of them identify people of color. It's hyper local, although we've increasingly been adding a very global audience. And um, we're really proud of the work that we've done. In fact, in the past two years or so, the audiences have more than doubled and we've been able to maintain the kind of diversity we're known for. What, what's an exhibition or program and program that you're really proud of in the last couple of years? You know, I really feel like I've just been hitting, you know, we've just been hitting our stride that things I've been talking about are starting to materialize because, you know, I've been at the museum for four and a half years yeah. now and in the beginning, big financial crisis, blah, blah, blah. It took a while to get, you know, to get things moving in the right direction. And, you know, uh, in February, we opened five collection shows that I was super proud of. Uh, we opened Jeffrey Gibson. We invited him to um, rethink our Native American collections. Mm -hmm. And he decided to take a look at um, ab about really challenging historic stereotypes about Native American identity and thinking about it as always modern. It's a really vibrant, beautiful, and I think quite brilliant installation. Mm -hmm. uh, next to it, we have a show called Climate in Crisis, where we look at the arts of the Americas through the lens of their cultural traditions um, and histories in relationship to climate crisis today and how they're being mm -hmm. challenged. We have our great Kahinde Wiley painting that was influenced by Napoleon's, um, Jacques-Louis David's Napoleon Crossing the Alps painting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and they've been paired together and it's for the first time that David has ever been in New York City. Uh, we have a feminist look at the Brooklyn Museum collection and we have a, a, uh, an exhibition called Global Conversations that puts African art in the center of the art historical dialogue and canon. So you'll see an Ethiopian cross next to it, like an Italian Renaissance cross, yeah, yeah. or a Nigerian power mask next to our Gilbert Stewart, you know, George Washington painting. So, so I, I was really, really proud of, of that moment. And, um, you know, I, I think that we're all challenged to find very meaningful, relevant ways to take a look at history and connect the past with the present. Yeah. Uh, uh, questions and conversations. The thing I'm regularly just humbled by is great works of art always seem to find relevance every generation, right? The, the, the pieces that kind of lend insight just over the course of time and you realize our perspective is changing on them, right? Well, and also we're expanding our ideas of what a great work of art Absolutely. is. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Absolutely. that's really exciting, what, whose culture is valued and how is it yeah. valued and how is it, how is it discussed and in, interpreted and understood? It's, um, I think both the Brooklyn Museum and the AGO have significantly younger audiences than, than many, other, many other museums. Yes, our audiences are very young. Yeah. I, I also spent four years living in Brooklyn and uh, 33 Flatbush Avenue, so above the Nevin Street Station. So it was my local museum for in my early 20s, so 91 to 95. So yeah. I, I love it. It's a place. We have some other questions here that are coming, coming in. Um, how do you attract younger generation to ensure young audiences return to, uh, to the museum other than school field trips? Uh, well, first of all, let me just share, and I don't know if it's the, uh, the case where you are, but um, you know, one of the things that keeps me up at night is that it looks like school field trips are not going to be allowed over the next year uh, from public schools um, to museums or anywhere uh, in the city. And that's really heartbreaking to me. It's hard to imagine uh, walking into the museum in the morning and not having tons of kids there. Uh, so that's, you know, one of those heartbreaking moments of COVID. And of course, like you, I'm sure we're pivoting to imagine how we get into the the classroom. Yeah. Uh, so, um, but um, the, you know, the question is young people and our audiences do skew very young. Uh, they're mostly in their 20s to the 40s. After uh, school, lots of teens just come and hang out at the museum looking at the exhibitions. And I think the way you do that is number one, uh, we're the only major museum in the city that's pay what you wish. 
and people can come in and pay absolutely nothing. And if you're 19 or under, you can come in for free. Yep. The more important thing or equally important thing is what you do. What kinds of shows are you showing? What kinds of conversations are you having? Because young people, I don't think they care about all the masterpieces in the collection. It's what you do with it. Yeah. Um, it's the conversations you're having and do they feel seen? Do they feel heard? Are, are they being engaged? Yeah. Um, but I think that in general, uh, museums like ours need to do a better job and making uh, the museum experience more joyous. Yeah. Uh, I think there's some work to do there. And when we do it, we'll continue to grow our young audiences. We um, moved just over a year ago to something called the annual pass, which is, you know, 35 bucks, you can come in and out, 35 Canadian. Uh, for a year. So anybody can sign up and that pass is free for anybody under 25. Um, and so when you look at our annual pass holders demographic, they actually reflect the socioeconomic and very close to the um, cultural ethnic diversity of the city. So we have about 150,000 annual pass holders now and 100,000 members. So right there, we've got a quarter million dollar core um, it's not cheap, um, but it's actually quite cheap if you think about uh, long-term engagement. And uh, um, so it's, and people are often surprised that we have way more 20 year olds than 60 year olds coming to the AGO. Um, 60 year olds are still coming um, and that's great, but it's, it's, I do think that the public programming, that engagement, the pop-up um, uh, you know, is really key. Um, You're right. And, and I didn't even mention that. I mean, our public programming team and our education team is on fire. I mean, yeah. you know, any given evening at the museum, you can be, you know, doing salsa lessons or yeah. yoga or, you know, poetry readings or whatever it is. And, and they really, they get this demographic. They are yeah. this demographic and they really program for them. Yeah. And it's so exciting to see. I'm always like, don't ask me. I'm not cool. Right. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, I know that. <laughs> I know that much. So um, I, I just think it's. But we were at one time. I just want everybody to know. Yes. <laughs> I find it a relief that I'm, I'm not sure I was actually. I'm really not so sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess you were. I wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe for 20 seconds someplace. Uh, <laughs> um, somebody asked a question a little bit about um, what the relationship is between the New York City institutions and the rest of the country. Um, you know, one of the upsides to COVID is how we as colleagues have really come together. So it's been wonderful, for example, that every Friday morning, there's a call with the New York City Museum directors, and we're all sharing information openly uh, and honestly and sharing the issues and, you know, sharing the struggle. And that's also happening on a national scale. And that's been really uh, quite wonderful um, to see um, the field really come together in a yep. time of crisis to support one another. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, one of the places that uh, I um, think has a very interesting model um, as we move forward is, is actually New Zealand, um, where Te Papa, which is their national museum, has basically two parallel uh, leadership structures. One is Maori and one is not. And um, Sometimes I think there's, there, uh, I'm not saying that's necessarily the leadership structure we should have, but sometimes looking at, I think we might want to look at restructuring power within the museum and how does one do that? Have you seen any interesting models of, of and would you be open to that? Um. Well, it's interesting because I've been writing all week about how to advance structural change where community is always you know, consistently at the center and heart of what we're doing. Um, so I'm not nearly where they're at in New Zealand. And I, you yeah. might have noticed I've been writing things down as you're speaking. Uh, and, um, but I do think that we have very, very far to go. So for example, there are some exhibitions where we bring community members in to help advise us on a, a number of projects or exhibitions, but there are many that we don't. We need to make that much more consistent. Uh, we also need to not uh, rely, and we don't rely on on, um, uh, on consultants for our diversity, equity, inclusion, and access work. We need to do that work ourselves, but we also need to have clear measurements and somebody who's, or a body of people who are really responsible for delivering on those things. And I think that we need to really take a look at what real metrics would be like for our social justice partnerships and, and how we're contributing to moving the needle and serving communities. So 
I think there are a lot of questions uh, that we'll be better able to answer as we move into a direction that really can support serious structural change as you're identifying. Um, I don't know the answers, but I just I have a feeling that it's a good time to think and talk about that. Uh, very, very important time. So when I look back at the last decade, um, and I've, I've been in museums that tend not to be in major cities, historic Shelburne, Vermont, Hawaii, which was amazing, um, et cetera. Um, I'm always struck when I go to museum conferences to the degree in which the commercial art market is framing decisions, directions, power. Um, there's a lot of capital, particularly in the contemporary area. And do you think that there'll be a rethink of that? Do you think COVID is impacting that? Um, what's your take on kind of the, the commercial market and how it's impacting and how it has impacted what we're doing? Do you know, honestly, people always ask me about the commercial market and I don't pay that much attention. <laughs> You know, I have a very simplistic view. More money for more artists, it's a good thing for them and for society. Yeah. Um, but I don't let the tastes of the marketplace define what I'm interested in. Got it. Uh, I'm really interested in how art can chronicle our times and connect us to the past and the present and help us imagine a, 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 a more decent future. <laughs> So, and, and work that just moves me. So I, I don't pay a lot of attention to the market, to be honest okay. with you. Okay. I know that's probably a bad answer for a museum director, but it's truthful. Well, that's, I think it's actually a great answer because I think there's that, you know, we're accountable to, to a public at the end of the day. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Stefan, I see that one of your um, panelists, somebody named, uh, not panelists, but somebody, one of the, our audience people named Kathleen. Yes. Um, talks about how hard Brooklyn has been hit by COVID. Yeah. yeah. What role can the museum play? Can I answer that question? I'd I'm love so to. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And thank you, Kathleen, for that question. Um, yes, Brooklyn has, in central Brooklyn in particular, has been among the hardest hit areas in New York City by COVID in terms of the number of illnesses and the number of deaths. So that's the hardest hit within the U.S., really. So it means it's yeah. one of the hardest hit in the United States. I mean, the Bronx has its own numbers and parts of Queens as well. So, uh, you know, the, the lesser cases of, are in Manhattan. And so what that should tell us and what is a fact is that it's hitting black and brown communities much harder than it is other communities. And so COVID is actually a reflection, if you will, of the, the problems of systemic racism and disinvestment from our black and brown communities. And it has been heartbreaking to see um, how our communities are facing not only high levels of, 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 of deaths, of grief and mourning and anxiety, health anxiety, housing anxiety, um, you know, food insecurity, uh, job insecurity, economic insecurity. And so very quickly at the museum, we knew that this would be the case. Yep. And we organized a board and staff task for community response task force. And we've had people come in who are trusted, uh, respected community leaders speak with us every single week. And the themes remain the same almost with every single speaker, whether they're elected official or they're a faith leader or they're a housing rights advocate, whoever they are. And so some of the things that we've been able to do immediately um, include we're partnering with a, a, a food distribution organization out of Bed-Stuy called the Campaign Against Hunger. And every Monday we're providing uh, boxes and bags of groceries and fresh produce for local community, first come, first serve. And we just started it two weeks ago and we have about 300 families coming already. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Uh, we were going to be a COVID test, mega testing site, but now the numbers are down in New York City. Hallelujah. Yeah. And so it looks like we won't have to be a COVID testing site, uh, which is uh, the best news imaginable. Um, we're we're, um, we're uh, a place uh, for the U.S. Census um, because historically black and brown communities have not been properly counted by the U.S. Census. We're trying to get that corrected because that yeah. will lead to federal support. So the list goes on and on and on. Um, our educators are pivoting. We're thinking we're doing more for our different things with our teens. There's a lot to be done. We won't be able to solve the problems, but we can help alleviate pain for some people. Who, what other museums do you think are doing it 
well? Uh, the Queen's Museum, I Queen's think, Museum. is doing it really well. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, absolute allies. Good. Um, one of the things I haven't asked you about, and we're kind of approaching the end, it, you, you were very involved with Creative Times. You were the director of it. Can you help tell our public, what is Creative Times? What did you do there? Kind of. So I was very blessed, uh, Stefan, for 21 years to be the director of a public arts organization that believed art belonged uh, freely in the public realm. Uh, so Creative Time commissioned a lot of extraordinary projects. I was very blessed to help artists realize their dream projects in public spaces. I got to work with Kara Walker on her big sort of sugar yeah. sphinx at the old Domino yeah. uh, sugar refinery and uh, on the Brooklyn waterfront. Uh, I, I worked with artists to um, commission the Tribute in Light, the two beacons of light that illuminate lower Manhattan after 9-11. Yeah. I had the um, incredible um, honor of working with uh, Paul Chan on um, on uh, presenting a, a version of Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot in the Lower Ninth Ward of New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina where the levee sure. broke. I mean, the list goes on, but I have been very blessed to work with great artists who have taught me a lot and to partner with them and helping them realize their dream projects in the public realm that were very timely and responsive to, to both place and time. Yeah, yeah it's, it's um, so often public art was just seen as a sculpture, right? And, and you, you, you helped to kind of blow that up a little bit. Yeah, it took a while to blow that up and to really advocate for the importance of artists in society and art in society. But I think that, you know, it, it took a decade or so, but we got there. What was the, so you went from a very nimble entrepreneurial organization uh, to a large museum in a Beaux-Arts building. Uh, what were some of the things you, yeah, that surprised you about that transition? Like, observations. Uh, what were some of the things that surprised me? I mean, you know, a lot of people said, oh, you can't move a big ship like this. That wasn't the case. The team was um, eager to be open and to trust and to try some new things. So that went really well. I had never worked in a museum before, so I had no idea what I was doing, but uh, you can learn it pretty quickly, I think. Um, you know, there's not a big difference between uh, asking for $10,000 or $100,000. So, you know, so <laughs> I've to ask yeah. for bigger numbers. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't know. Um, I guess one of the things is I've had to learn to micromanage less, which might, if I have any staff la uh, listening in, they'd be laughing at me right now. Uh, but I, I try not to micromanage and I try to hire really great people and let them do their job and get out of the way and only be there for them when they need me to be. So uh, it's, it's not always easy, but I think it's really important. Um, so what's a work of art that you live with? That you love? Um, what's a work of art that I, I live with that I love? I, I mean, there's so many actually. And in my apartment in the city, I'm not in the city right now, obviously. Uh, I wish I had a place like this in the city with open space and light. <laughs> and I was shocked part. when you told me how, how many square feet your place in the city is. I was like, that's yeah, so it's like 700 square feet, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this one's only like 900 square feet, but it feels, you know, so much bigger. <laughs> <laughs> so um, an artwork that I absolutely love um, is I have a print by Richard Serra of, um, of uh, an image of um, a, a prisoner, Abu Ghraib, from Abu Ghraib. Oh, yeah. You know, that great image of- Yes, I know that, yes. And being covered by his head and- um, I think about that work a lot. Yeah, that's an But I, I have to say every artwork I live with um, tends to be an artist that I know well and I'm yeah. close to, and every single one of them means a great deal to me. Okay. Well, thank you. And Pastor Nick, you're the director of the Brooklyn Museum. Thank you for spending some time and sharing your thoughts with our public. It was so great to see you, and thank you for tuning in. And when the border opens, please visit us. I will. Okay, okay. great. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.